Hello and welcome to week three, part three of EGM 703, Principles of Radar. In this lesson, we'll learn all about radar and radar remote sensing. So radar is a word that originally stood for radio detection and ranging, though at this point, at least in English, it's a noun. It's an active microwave remote sensing system. This means that the source of the signal that we're measuring comes from the satellite or the sensor itself, rather than being supplied by the sun or emitted by the target that we're looking at. The basic idea behind radar is that we send out a signal from the satellite or transmitter and we measure the signal that comes back. When the signal comes back to the receiver, we know how long it took for it to come back, which means we can work out how far away the target is. The distance or range R to the target is just the speed of the signal multiplied by the travel time divided by two. We also measure the signal strength or amplitude, which tells us something about how much energy is reflecting or scattering off of the target. We can also measure the polarization of the signal that comes back. Many radar satellites, for example, will transmit a signal in one polarity and measure the return in a different polarity, which tells us something about the target that the signal has scattered off of. We might also measure the partial wavelength or phase of the signal that comes back. This is especially useful for some applications that we'll talk about next week. And finally, we might measure the frequency of the signal to see if there's, any there's been any change from the signal that we sent out. The radar equation, shown here, tells us how the power received by the sensor, P sub r, depends on a number of different factors. These include the power transmitted, P sub t, the antenna gain, g, which tells us how well the antenna transmits the received signal into electric power that can be recorded, the distance to the target, or the range, and finally the radar cross-section of the target, sigma. So we've already established that range is just the distance between the sensor and the target. It's where we get the ranging in radio detection and ranging. But now we want to think about the range resolution. That is, how well we can distinguish between two different targets using our radar system. So as an example, if we have two targets here that are close together and we send out a radar signal towards them, when the signal comes back to the sensor, it will record a signal like this from the closer of the two objects. And then a very short time later, it will record the return from the second object. If the targets are too close together, these peaks will overlap and we won't be able to tell the difference between them. This is just going to look like one very wide return peak. On the other hand, if our targets are slightly further apart, like this, the first return will look like this, and the second return will come just a bit later, and we'll be able to see that these are, in fact, two different peaks, representing two different targets. So it turns out that the range resolution of the sensor depends partly on the bandwidth of the transmitted signal, uh, this tau sub p. The shorter the signal, the better our ability to tell the difference between the different returns. And the formula for it is given here. It's just the bandwidth multiplied by the speed of the signal divided by 2 because we're going there to the target and back again. Since the speed is fixed, the only thing that we can change is how wide the signal is, and we'll talk a little bit more about how we do this in practice later on. So we can differentiate between the different types of radar systems that we use for remote sensing based on the kind of measurement that they take. Non-imaging radar systems can be broken into two categories. Radar altimeters, which measure distance. The example here of a satellite radar altimeter shows the basic idea. We have a signal being sent to the Earth's surface and we're measuring the time it takes for it to return. If we know the satellite's position and the direction that it's looking, then we know the height of the surface. The other main type of non-imaging radar is called a scatterometer, which measures the signal that is scattered back to the sensor. And as you might have already guessed, the other main category of radar system is an imaging radar. These systems look sideways at the ground, and as the sensor moves, it builds an image through repeated measurements similar to the optical satellites that we've studied so far.
The main types of imaging radars that you might encounter are side-looking airborne radars, radars, which are systems that are actually mounted on an aircraft, and synthetic aperture radars, which are most commonly found on satellites, and we will cover more about how SAR sensors work in the next lesson. As mentioned, radar altimeters are used to measure the distance between the satellite and the Earth's surface. They can achieve very high accuracy, down to as little as about 3 centimeters or so difference, which is incredibly impressive given that we're making these measurements from about 700 kilometers away. The large footprint of the altimeter signal, however, means that we're limited to measuring the height of very large, relatively flat surfaces like the ocean or the interior of the ice sheets. Um, <clears throat> Among other applications, radar altimeters are used to map bathymetry over large stretches of the ocean. Because underwater ridges and structures exert a gravitational attraction, water will essentially pile up over these high points and over trenches and other low points. We see depressions on the ocean surface. Because altimeters can map small changes in elevation, we can use this to calculate the depth of the water after we've accounted for things like waves and tides and currents and also atmospheric effects. Radar scatterometers detect the signal that is scattered by the Earth's surface. That is, they are measuring the radar cross-section, sigma naught, of the surface. The main application we see for radar scatterometers is in measuring wind speed over the ocean. So remember that sigma naught depends on the surface roughness and the viewing angle. In the diagram here, you can see how this satellite, the Advanced Scatterometer, or ASCAT, works. It sends out beams in six directions, three on either side of the satellite. The ocean roughness depends on the near-surface wind speed. That is, wind is creating these very small capillary waves that change how that signal is scattered back to the sensor and we can relate the measured backscatter to the wind speed. When we have different viewing angles, we see different amounts of backscatter, which means we can also work out the wind direction. This example shown here, provided by AU Metsat, shows the measured wind field of Hurricane Matthew in September 2016. And we can clearly see here the spiral pattern of the storm, which is measured over a very large area. Next up, we come to imaging radars. So imaging radars are tilted to the side rather than looking straight down. This is so that we can make measurements at different distances or ranges along the ground. The signal from objects further away in the slant range is going to be recorded later. As the signal goes out, the wavefront expands in a circular shape, at least when we're viewing this in two dimensions. So the signal from the house here will be returned first, and the signal from the tree will come back later. Using trigonometry, we can transform the distance in the satellite's look direction, slant range, to the ground range, or the distance along the ground from the satellite path. As the antenna moves along the flight direction, or azimuth, it continues recording, which means that we can effectively build an image one line of pixels at a time. One problem with sending signals is that sending a signal or a pulse that's powerful enough to return a detectable signal from space while also being short enough to give us very good range resolution is really hard. Fortunately, we do have a solution to this problem. We just make it a unique signal. Rather than transmitting a pulse that's just a single peak, we instead transmit a signal with a frequency that changes over time, like this, and we call this a chirp. So the change in frequency from the start of the pulse, or the start of the chirp, to the end of the chirp is, known, is, is the inverse of the bandwidth, or tau p, of the signal. So when we receive signals, it's important to remember that we're getting returns from lots of different places all at once. The result is often very noisy, and it's actually really difficult to see the signal that we sent out. By correlating the signal that we sent with the signal that we recorded, though, a process known as range compression, we can actually find the signal that went out, and more importantly, the time that it was recorded.
So this helps us to solve the problem of overlapping signals, and it means that we can actually create high-resolution radar images from satellite sensors, because it's much easier to send a time-varying frequency signal than it is to send a very short, powerful signal. It turns out that for these systems that send out these frequency-modulated chirps, the range resolution is just inversely proportional to the frequency range. So the more that we change the frequency of our pulse, the better the resolution that we get. And again, this is so much easier than trying to send out a short, powerful pulse. So the last concept that we'll introduce in this lesson is the Doppler effect. So if the source of a wave is moving, for example, stars in distant galaxies or cars making sounds on the motorway, that motion actually causes a shift in the frequency of the signal being sent out. An example that is hopefully familiar to you is an ambulance with its siren on. The siren is making sound waves that propagate radially away from the ambulance, like the circle shown here. But a few seconds ago, the ambulance was a little bit further back, and so the sound wave that it made at that location is centered here, and it looks like this relative to its current location. And a few seconds before that, it was over here. So the sound wave from that point in time will look like this, and so on. So if we're observing the ambulance here, where the ambulance is moving towards us, we see how these sound waves are essentially being compressed or pushed together. And the frequency that we observe is increased relative to the original frequency. If we're on the other side here, observing the ambulance moving away from us, we see how the frequency that we observe is going to be lower than the original frequency because the waves are being sort of stretched out. If we know the original frequency, we can calculate the velocity of the source relative to the observer based on the observed frequency. This is the principle behind things like the radar guns that are used to measure vehicle speeds on the road. Alternatively, if we know the relative velocity of the source, for example, a satellite, we can calculate the shift in the frequency, which also helps us determine where on the ground a signal was returned from, and we'll come back to this in the next lesson. So in this lesson, we've discussed how radar is active remote sensing. The satellite is actually sending out the signal and measuring the return. The signal that we measure depends on the properties of the target, such as the normalized radar cross-section, as well as the properties of the signal that we sent out. We covered the two main flavors of radar systems that we use in uh, microwave remote sensing. We have imaging and non-imaging radars, which provide one-dimensional or two-dimensional measurements, respectively. And finally, we covered how, with some neat signal processing techniques, we can improve the range resolution of our radar system. That is, how well we can distinguish between targets that are at different distances to our sensor. You can read more about the topics we've discussed here in the textbooks, Lillisan, Kiefer, and Chipman in Chapter 6, or Campbell and Wynn Chapter 7. This website, radartutorial.eu, has a number of good explanations and visualizations for some of the concepts that we've covered here, and also provides a lot more information about the different systems that we might see. For more information on how we can measure wind surface wind speed from space, this page from EU Met Train is worth a look. And finally, I've included links to two videos made by ESA that explain why radar, sen radar satellites are so important and also how radar altimeters are used. That's all for this lesson. I hope you found it interesting. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email me or post in the discussion forum on Blackboard. Bye.